There is nothing more infuriating to me because if you look at PPCT, that was also a data-driven approach to law enforcement defensive tactics. However, the data was trash. It was, you can make data say anything you want it to say, right? The data they used was trash. I was, I was trained on PPCT. The reason I started training jujitsu was because it failed. Straight arm bar takedown did not work at all against a not really even resisting suspect who was one hit child support warrant, right? Like I was like, I'm not getting my ass beat <laughs> for a child support warrant. Walked my ass into a jiu-jitsu school the next day. Haven't left. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty happy to have uh, Adam on today uh, after many times. And uh, so Adam, uh, thank you for uh, coming on the show finally. Yeah, thank you for having me. We were supposed to, I know, connect a couple weeks back and that was 100% my fault. Kids and, <laughs> and everything and just, man, when my kid had pink eye and they gave it to the other kid and my wife got, it was just, it was just a whole mess. So not an excuse, but I do apologize. Um, but I am, I'm very happy to be here. So my, my, my first question, so, uh, because I know you have a, a law enforcement background, uh, cause obviously we, we do, uh, research into people who are having on the show. Uh, how did you get into law enforcement in the first place? And how long did you stay in law enforcement? Yes. Yeah, so my reason for getting into law enforcement is I usually say this, I was not smart enough to be a doctor. Um, so I decided to be a cop. No. So in college, I, I've, I've always wanted to help people. And I was very interested in the medical field. I volunteered at a few hospitals that my mom worked at and just absolutely loved it. Went to college, was going to go the biology pre-med route. Then biology class, I was like, man, this is not, this is not for me. And I was like, well, man, well, if I can't do that, what else do I want to do? Ended up meeting uh, one of my best friends now who's both of his parents are cops. And so fast forward to about senior year, I had an internship with a relatively large agency in South Carolina, did that for about a year and just fell in love. I was like, you guys get paid to do this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. I got to volunteer with the SWAT team and their, uh, bloodhound tracking unit and things like that. And man, it was, it was fun. And so this is what I want to do. Got out of college course, put my applications into different agencies, ended up getting hired on uh, with an agency in South Carolina, went to the academy, put in about seven years, left as a full-time training sergeant. And uh, now I, I recently left about 2021, 20, 22, uh, I'm sorry, 2020, excuse me. And from there, I basically now run EFT and EFC full-time. And I was actually doing EFT while I was an active cop and it, it kind of grew into something bigger than it is uh, now. And, and it's been, it's been great. Very hard to leave, but I enjoy it. What I do now. So you're saying EFT and EFC, uh, those are acronyms for your company. What, what is that company? Correct. So I have effective fitness training and then effective fitness combatives. We just call EFT and EFC for short. And they, they kind of encompass the foundation of what law enforcement needs to be better, right? To help improve the profession. I saw it as a cop, the lack of, honestly, the first thing I saw was the lack of fitness, the lack of just that foundation of physical ability. Just as guys were getting older, they were just deteriorating. And it wasn't even, you know, even guys with five to seven years on were just packing on the weight and starting to complain about, you know, aches and things like that. And you guys don't do anything about it. There's no structure, there's no help. And so I developed a, I was actually tasked with developing a fitness program for my agency, did all that work presented it to administration and they basically put it on hold. And then that was basically written a business plan at that point. I just implemented it uh, into a business model. And then it grew from having like 15 clients to now we've, we've had over 17,000 law enforcement officers in less than four years, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. Cause I was going to say you left, uh, law enforcement, uh, in, in seven years. So, it was obviously very lucrative to to go into business for your uh, companies that you came up with. Yeah, it it kind of got to a point where, and of course, I had mentors that were that were really helping me with kind of making these decisions, and which was a huge a huge factor in that. 
and it was these companies could excuse me these companies could grow um but they're not going to grow without more time and your attention i was putting in time as a cop and then i was also coming home and working basically another full-time job every day and it was not healthy here i am preaching about health and fitness and i'm also getting like four hours of sleep which is obviously not ideal and so it kind of got to a point and again i've always wanted to help people kind of goes back to what i originally stated and it just i've helped i feel like i've helped more co- i know that i've helped more law enforcement officers now uh out of the profession that i have in the profession and it was very difficult for me to leave again even with only seven years in it it was my identity at that point and i had a very i had a very difficult time leaving um i still i i still do um think about it all the time my best friends are still active cops and yeah it's just i'm just so mission driven now that there's there's uh so much more that we're doing with with those two companies it's amazing and i'm i'm very grateful for the team behind those two companies as well so one of the big things with uh you in, in particular is that you've got this instagram page police posts that has really taken off and it's I, I encourage everybody who's on Instagram to to go and and look at this uh, massive uh, page because it basically pulls the cover off of you know what's going on. And I think once I mean there was there back when I started, it's, it's been twenty years now. So back when I started, there there was cell phones, but we didn't have the camera cell phones. But we were always taught, we were taught in the academy, like, you know, you got to imagine there's cameras everywhere because, you know, there's surveillance cameras. Now we got the surveillance cameras. Now we got the cell phone cameras and now we got body worn cameras. So you're, you're seeing exactly what cops have to go through every day. And there's no shortage of content. <laughs> there's no shortage of content. And now I, I, are you site that that page or do you have a team working with you on that because not only are you just showing the video because i know there's some channels out there that uh show the video but uh you 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 provide some analysis or some feedback on what you're seeing and i guess that kind of makes it controversial because you're you're you know somewhat criticizing some people and not to mention in any uh law enforcement specific page, website, whatever, you're going to get the haters that come on and like to throw things. So is that something that you're doing all the time or is that something that you're having someone to handle team so our team so between the two companies which includes police post uh as well it's about 28 people um so it, it's a relatively large i mean it, it's a fully back end i mean there's there's five five or seven of those 28 are full-time um and so i have people you know obviously helping me find videos edit the videos and then as it pertains to the training points that's that's like coming from our team um it's it's some me some of the guys um on the team that have way more experience especially on the combative side i mean you're looking at all of them are high level black belts in jiu-jitsu most of them have 15 plus years in law enforcement and multiple different areas in law enforcement and so the experience that that page brings that the teams bring is is absolutely insane um again seven years is is absolutely nothing there's nothing that i can say that you you haven't seen or probably done right so especially you know and working in a high call volume area you know with that being said you know as it pertains to the haters and the monday morning quarterback and things like that yeah it's it's really easy to rant really really is it's much harder to provide solutions and that's what a lot of people don't do. It's so it's so easy to go, well, I would have done this, or they should have done this and that. And you're right, maybe they should have. Okay. But what are you doing to help improve that? What are you doing to provide a training resource so that it may not happen again? What value are you providing? And so that's kind of where I say a lot of things like be beneficial or get the fuck out. Right. Like either you're gonna help grow or you're just gonna just talk. And talking doesn't do shit. And you know as well as I do, it doesn't do anything. And I get very, very uh not, I don't want to say emotional, but it's a very strong topic for me because people will criticize, oh, here you go, Monday morning quarterback. And again, I'm like, yeah, you you could call it whatever you want, uh, whatever makes you, you know, sleep at night. But the actor, you know, but the AARs that that occur, you know, save lives. I've had multiple officers reach out to me whose incidents that I've posted and not one of them. I haven't had one, a single one in almost a decade 
tell me, oh, you weren't there. You shouldn't have done that. I've had multiple say, hey, man, can we talk about this on the phone? I'm like, absolutely. Tell me everything that you experienced. Tell me everything that you saw that the body cam maybe didn't pick up or that you know the cell phone footage didn't pick up. Tell me everything so I can give the best information out to law enforcement. And then I'll take that information, run up by my team, have those guys basically review it, send it back to me. So it's not just like I'm sitting on my couch and I see a video, I just copy and paste a video and then just write some points. No, there's a lot of thought process and there's a lot of resources that are there to provide. So law enforcement actually has actionable items. Okay, so before before we get into some of the stuff that I know that we're going to talk about, but there's some things in the news that has come up that I think is just fascinating. Uh, I'm sure you're well aware of uh, in New York City uh, the Neely chokehold or submission hold that the the Marine did on this guy who was accosting subway riders, and you know the guy was pretty insane and said that, you know, he had nothing to live for and he was going to, didn't care if he died and basically, you know, seemed to perceive uh, uh, or become somewhat of a threat to uh, this guy. So he, he did a uh, uh, carotid hold, you know, and this, obviously people say chokehold, you know, people most of the time think of chokehold as, you know, compression, wind compression on the, on the trachea. This is a, basically you're cutting off the supply, uh, Mata Leon, if you know some Brazilian and it, people go out, but this guy wasn't going out. So what, what are your thoughts on that? So I don't know too much about that case in particular. I've seen, seen the video of uh, short clips and things like that without, without having an idea of too much of the uh, context of the case. As it pertains to the actual choke itself, it's relatively safe, right? If you train jujitsu, You've been rear naked choked or 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 vacuum net restraint, whatever people want to call it, multiple times. And probably multiple times within an hour, right? And it is a very safe choke if done properly, depending on the individual. Obviously, situation and individual dictates. But as it pertains to the facts of that case, I'm not particularly sure of of the facts. I don't want to I don't want to speak on that. But as it pertains to the hold itself. Now, there was a study done out of Calgary, I think in 2001, 2012, I think it was 2012, about the effectiveness and the dangers of the vascular neck restraint or the rear naked choke is commonly referred to. And it's relatively safe if applied correctly and actually very beneficial. It's a, I think it's a very beneficial tool for law enforcement. Unfortunately, in this situation, you know, a man lost his life, um, you know, again, I I I don't I don't know the 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 details of the case, so I don't want to speak on that. But as it pertains to the choke itself, I'm a fan um, of the actual. Uh, I guess it, it is a, a type of strangle, um, but it's also done with with you know skill and training. It can be very effective. Well, the optics of it are are tough Not right good. now yeah. because first you had George Floyd where he said he couldn't breathe and all that, and then now you have another guy that. Uh, died. We don't. The interesting is we don't know the toxicology report. We don't know what was in the system, what was causing. You know, we we, we really don't know what the cause of death is. And they right. throw out that it was homicide. And I just you know tell people, yes, it's it's either going to be suicide or homicide. That means it's homicide. It's it's death by other circumstances. He didn't kill himself. Something else caused him. So that's why they call it homicide. It doesn't mean that it was murder. So take that with a grain of salt. But explain to people. Uh, what what this uh, rear naked choke uh, is. Yeah. So basically what it does is it compresses the arteries in the neck and it cuts off blood flow to the brain. What that does is it basically deprives the brain of, of blood and oxygen, at least from what I understand. Now, I was actually told what it does, it doesn't deprive it, it holds it there, which is kind of something uh, new that I recently was that it actually holds it there, doesn't prevent it uh, from like, getting there because 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 obviously there's blood in your brain at the at the time your arteries are are then you know occluded right um and there's a point in time where someone will lose consciousness it is it is brief and it isn't it doesn't have any long-term effects per the research obviously individuals anatomies are different and i would not recommend doing this to someone of you know uh obviously a young child or in, you know, like an elderly person, or if they look like they're, you know, not healthy, probably not a wise idea to administer something like this. 
as it pertains to just like every day, I'm not talking law enforcement at all right now. I'm just talking just in general. Um, but yeah, but basically what it does is it basically puts someone unconscious and then it gives you an opportunity to, to then have somewhat of, of control or again, you back off and deescalate and kind of create space. And I think sometimes we've seen videos like, like this incident with the Marine, uh, where, where sometimes it can go too far again, without knowing the details of the case. Um, you know, just, you know, just, just, you say there's so many factors that play into that, but yeah, I'm a huge fan and like the sports setting of the rear naked choke. Uh, I, I am a huge fan of it. It's a very, it's the most powerful move. I believe any type of choke is the most powerful because it's not really dependent on how much pain tolerance it's, uh, either you can't or you cannot, you know, stay conscious. And it's a, it's a very powerful submission in sport jujitsu. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and it's, you know, it's one of the things I know there, there are guys that have like super strong necks, but generally, uh, it's, it's a weak spot on, on the body that doesn't matter how big or strong you are. Like my kid can get me in a rear naked choke and it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm going to go. And it, it's the funniest thing when that, when that happens, uh, but we're not just doing that. This is in class. Obviously I'm not just right. choking him around the house. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it'll be interesting how, how this turns out, uh, I think it's it's tough how uh, these things become politicized, uh, and it's that location of the country. Uh, but uh, I think I think that in law enforcement right now, it it's tough because there's so many. And I hate to say it, but just like eyes on law enforcement in terms of what they can and cannot do, and people inside law enforcement, cops out there, are feeling it. They're feeling like. They're, they're, they're having to do things with, with one hand behind their back. And then now you're seeing, like, like if you look at police posts, you'll see officers trying to subdue, not subdue, but put into handcuffs, make an arrest of an individual, and they're resisting. And it becomes this tug of war over, you know, there's like a lack of control. And I'm not saying that every cop needs to know jujitsu, which would be great. Uh, but just the, 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 the tug of wars don't, and you know, something else I don't see, I don't see impact strikes anymore. I, I rarely see somebody doing an impact strike just to gain compliance because people are afraid because of the optics. Oh, he was beating down. So it, and I think the more these things go out, the worse the outcomes can be for people. You know, the more you get into a knockdown drag out, the options start to fade and then some, the, a gun gets into play and then someone gets hurt or whatever. But what what are your thoughts on that? Sure. So I'll address this in sections here. So as it pertains to subject control and like saying, let's just let's just start with single officer apprehension. You go to a call, it's just you by yourself. You have to then control an individual to then put them in handcuffs, right? A lot of factors can obviously come in play, right? A lot of options are we can stay engaged and continue to fight from the clinch, take them down go into some type of uh, top position advantage, extract arms and put in handcuffs. Or we could create space, hold it, deadly force coverage, hold it less lethal. Whatever situation, you know, if you're by yourself, I I personally prefer cops use deadly force uh, coverage just because you don't know what they're going to present at the time. Um, if you have multiple officers, then great. You have that less lethal option you know, if given. As it pertains to why why the tug of wars occur, it's because a multitude of things. One, the profession by nature has provided subpar lowest common denominator training that has not really truly been pressure tested. Now, just like in the military, which I was not in, but I have friends, very close friends in the military, over the past 20 years, tactics and things have changed because they have all this real world information. Now they change the way they enter rooms. They change the way that they manipulate their weapons, change the way that they actually load out their weapons, their kits, so on and so forth, right? Things are changing as, as we're getting more information. Well, we can do that now, right? So what we did at EF Combatives was Jay Wadsworth. He's our, he's our director, one of the co-owners and founders of EFC. Jay's a, a second degree black belt, so high level black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, competes, you can Google him, professional MMA guy, just retired from Jamestown Police Department with 22 years of law enforcement experience there, SWAT team narcotics guy, you name it, Jay's probably done it. 
And I got with Jay and said, hey man, you are kind of a unicorn in this in this kind of field as it pertains to subject control weapons based stuff. So I, I brought him a bunch of data and all that data was basically show trends to where we're having issues in law enforcement. Officers going hands on, officer assaults, officers getting their guns taken from them, like their own guns. Uh, subjects presenting guns within certain distances and how do we address these issues, right? So we look at the data and again, the data is not the end all be all. It's it's just, it gives you have trends. So with Jay's experience, we basically created a curriculum that allows law enforcement officers, whether it's one or multiple officers and even including canine, um, to have somewhat of a structure and what that structure is, it's basically concepts and principles of two pressure-tested martial arts uh, and sport, wrestling and jiu-jitsu. However, wrestling and jiu-jitsu are very effective by themselves. They're also very effective together. But there's two things that those sports don't include. One, integrated with weapons, right? In sports, they're not pulling guns, knives, tasers, anything like that. Integrated into the environment of policing. So... It's not unmats. The environment's unknown. You also have to worry about things about case law, use of force policy, so on and so forth. Okay. That phrase right there is extremely important. The principles and concepts of wrestling and jujitsu integrated with weapons into the environment of policing. That is what works. Now, within those concepts and principles, which are very foundational, right? Talk about structure based posture, breaking those things down. And then the common responses we see from resisting sus suspects and subjects um, to then address those problems with the concepts and principles. So yes, some of it is technique driven. You will learn this technique. This will help. It's just, it's, it's just an option, but it's also creating critical thinkers within that, within that small time frame, given, giving them the ability to slowly see the situation happening, even though it's happening fast and address it accordingly, whether that's with their hands, creating distance, engaging with their own weapon, paying the suspect's weapons, whatever the case may be. And so as you did talk about, and I'm going to go into the impact realm. Impact weapons are basically pain compliance, right? We know that pain compliance has a high propensity to fail. And the reason why that is, is I'm not against striking. I think striking is a great thing. Striking is something that helps to set up dilemmas a lot of the time. Because if somebody's striking somebody, their hands are immediately going to come here to protect their head and not going to go down to their waistband where they may have a gun. Right, so then they have the dilemma to protect their face or go for a gun. Most of the time, people are going to protect their face, which allows us to then address whatever we have to address. Jay, Jay has a great example of mixed martial arts, his background in mixed martial arts. Sometimes you'll watch guys go three or four rounds, five rounds even sometimes, with 50 plus significant strikes and nobody's knocked out. Right, So the idea of I'm just going to knock them out you may or may not knock them out, right? The odds are you probably won't do that. If the situation even calls for that kind of force. So our goal is to maintain an advantage always and to obviously maintain the, the protection of innocent civilians, the police officer, and then the suspect itself. And that's kind of where a lot of people currently, why this company was created was because there was a lack of a solid curriculum that encompassed everything law enforcement officers need to know as it pertains to whether they're on duty, plain clothes, canine unit, et cetera, SWAT even. There's just certain aspects that weren't being covered. And if they were being covered, they weren't being covered well. And that's not saying that there's other great, because there are great companies. I just, we talked about Ruben, right? Ruben's a great guy. Ruben's got a really good curriculum he follows. Now, is does it pertain to what we do every day on the streets? Some of it does, yes. But some of it also does not. Right. So I think that's, that's kind of where we shine is that we bring that pressure tested data driven approach to law enforcement combatives. So the hard part, and it's funny, I, when I was just talking with Joel Turner on the last podcast, it's the, the training aspect in law enforcement. Now, Cause I, th I think that most people can agree the listeners of the show, the, view, the watchers of the show, uh, while they're not all law enforcement officers, you know, it's a wide variety of you know, truckers and military, and, but they all want law enforcement to succeed in their job. They all want them to, you know, because they're, they're citizens of the community, they, they people, they're next door neighbors. So they want them to succeed 
They want them to have the tools to succeed. But from from the law enforcement perspective, it's tough because especially, you know, in the small agencies, it comes down to funding. We don't have enough money for some of these programs. Uh, in the larger agencies, it becomes uh, a matter of getting the training out there because you have so many people in the agency that you've got to run those people through and you've got mandatory state requirements that you have to do. You have to have in-service, you have to have uh, quals, and then you're running thousands of people through. It's tough to, you know, be able to teach people these things. You know, if you have that initiative, right, you're taking classes and shooting or you're competing and shooting on your own. If you have that interest, you're going to a mixed martial art, excuse me, mixed martial art class or uh, a BJJ class on your own. So how do you, and I know you're an outside entity, but how would agencies incorporate stuff like this so that people, because you can show somebody a technique, but in 30 seconds, once they leave that training, they're already thinking <laughs> about something different. Right. That's a, that's actually a really good point, And we do address that. When, so one good thing about our companies, specifically EF Combatives, is that not all of us are cops in the company. We have a lot of individuals who thrive on education and learning and the science behind how people learn, how people retain information. There is a way that we do that that is not being done currently. And we are we are already in just this year that we've trained it's close to 70 agencies just just this year so far. Ranging from agencies that have 2,300 people like the Michigan State Police, Fort Worth PD, all the way down to guys that have 10, right? And that's okay. It does not matter. That's also one of the things is we're a mission-driven company. So whether you have five officers or deputies or you have 5,000, does not matter. Now, the way we go about that is that we do offer online training as well. That online training isn't just what you would consider like your typical jiu-jitsu instructional for those that have bought jiu-jitsu instructionals from probably the largest jiu-jitsu company, instructional company in the world. It's nothing like that. It's a little more structured, has a little more, um, a little more foundational skill built into it, right? So basically we take everything from the foundation and then we build upon that foundation. So everything is, again, it's a full curriculum. It's a full combative system. So if how we teach people to learn, like you said, you have a thousand people, how do you train a thousand people? You obviously... To have a four-day course that would certify a thousand people would take years to probably do. Because you have to have guys on the road, all that stuff, time off. Now, we can do that in the sense of we have to have some core guys, obviously the the training cadre, training unit, whatever you want to call them. Those guys need to be certified. Those guys can then teach the things that in-service. But how we teach it in-service, we also do provide a curriculum that is basically a condensed version of the much larger course. Also allowing them to be able to take the online course prior to coming to in-service or prior, prior to coming to some type of DT training is going to really eliminate a lot of that. I'm starting from scratch in person. What do I do? Right. When you come in with those mental reps already done, that there's a whole lot of science behind mental reps of actually visualizing training and then implementing that physically. Um, and so that's kind of our approach to that. And it's been very successful. We're actually in the process. We have a few agencies now that are actually now collecting data on that specifically uh, with our program. It's going to be really awesome to see, to see the outcome of that as well. So as it pertains to how do we implement that, there is a way that we can then have each, each officer has one of these, right? Every single, every single that I know that there's not one that I don't know that doesn't have a cell phone, whether it's department issued or not. Um, we have an app on the phone. You click on it, you can take the course on your phone. You can ask questions to our instructors on the phone. You can send videos to our instructors on the phone about how, you know, hey, I had this come up, I had this vehicle extraction issue. What do you guys recommend? And we give recommendations on there. We can also come in there. We obviously do, you know, the in-person class stuff, which obviously that's the best training you're going to get. In-person is the best, but online, those mental reps are huge. Maybe you're too far away. Your agency is too small. There's a, get a partner and train. That is the best thing to do now, going back to jujitsu. Training jujitsu in a sport realm is extremely beneficial. It, it, it is that foundational work that we talked about. Like you being uh, a blue belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, you then taking our course, 
you're going to have no problem understanding, retaining, and then being able to use the curriculum on the streets immediately. Just because of, of you're not a black belt, I'm not a black belt, but I was able to look at the curriculum and go, oh yeah, absolutely. I've been in neon top positions before. I know how the near side work. I understand the principles and concepts of jujitsu, right? Integrating that to where it's not rocket science. You're not like, hey, here's 50 techniques at work because you're going to be like 50. Dude, I remember five, maybe, and I can maybe even do, do those half ass, right? But if you're incorporating the foundation of the of those of those core things, so that's why we always tell guys: if you train jujitsu on your own, even better. You're going to have no issues picking it up. Now let's incorporate weapons. Let's incorporate your case law and policy, and then that's what's going to build an amazing and effective police officer. I actually had a buddy of mine who just took a class today, and he he sent me a message. He sent me some of his body cam footage, and he goes, "Look, man, literally day one back on the job from the course." I utilized knee on top with head pressure, was able to extract the arms. And then he goes, dude, it was nothing. He goes, it's, he goes, best course. And he's, he's been to other law enforcement courses before. And he's like, dude, this is, and he doesn't really train. He thinks he's just, he just started training, maybe like a two stripe white belt. But he was like, he was able to pick it up so fast. And that's, that's the thing is if you make it too complicated for cops, they're not going to remember and they're not going to want to do it. You know, I mean, I'm just, again, just preaching to the choir here. <laughs> well, I think I, I, I what you're saying is is very true and from two different perspectives here one in 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 the gunplay world i always preach get into competition and you know yeah you might suck but like you say you're pressure testing you're putting yourself under that stress and guess what now the more you do it you're 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 handling that gun a lot more you've got that subconscious skill and you're out there doing stuff, you're, you're clearing malfunctions, there's no thought process to it, and it's very comfortable for you. And the same thing that I've noticed, you know, with, with doing jujitsu, and then you start, you, you don't feel uncomfortable in engagements with another person, another human being, specifically when they're trying to hurt you or they're trying to resist you. you you've been there before, and it's, it's just, you're just, you know, you're, you're not even thinking about it. You're not, it's not a, a mental struggle. You're not, you're not, you're actually more relaxed because you, you've been there. And I think, I think I've seen, at least where I work, more and more people are actually getting into, I would have to say BJJ than competition. I mean, a lot of people always ask me how to get into competition. And I always show them how to do it. And this is for pistol competition. And then, you know, they don't show up. That's just fine. But uh, I, you know, because there's that equation, like, and then you talked about before, you're going hands on a lot more time than you're actually drawing your gun and shooting somebody, um, which it's 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 an interesting dichotomy because you need to be. That's the hard part about being a cop. You need to be great <laughs> that that one percent of the time that you're actually going to pull your gun and shoot somebody. You better but be we good. Don't put the, <laughs> you, you you don't put that kind of training into it, but we have to put our training into and, and administrators know that well. To, to into that hands-on stuff. And I know that you had said before, and I wanted to get this in, uh, the biggest scam in defensive tactics, defense, defensive tactics, I'm having a hard time today. Defensive tactics is, Sunday. <laughs> it's a Sunday, uh, pressure point, PP, CT, I think it is. Yeah. Uh, which Trash. originally when, when I was in law enforcement, that's what they started with. We had some really and strange, strange techniques that we had to do, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I think I think we're evolving. So this is the thing about PPCT is now I have been known to again, I, I have a team that does help me with the posts on police posts, but I am the only one that does post on police post. Okay. So some of the things that are posted that are relatively controversial or just to piss people off in a good way, with also providing value. You can piss people off and provide value at the same time, people. Is is specifically certain people that push subpar products and make money. There is nothing more infuriating to me because if you look at PPCT, that was also a data driven approach to law enforcement and defensive tactics. However, the data was trash. It was you can make data say anything you wanted to say, right? The data they used was trash. I was I was trained on PPCT. The reason I started training jujitsu was because it failed. 
straight arm bar takedown did not work at all against a not really even resisting suspect who is one hit child support warrant, right? Like I was like, I'm not getting my ass beat <laughs> for a child support warrant. Walked my ass into a jiu-jitsu school the next day. Haven't left. That was six and a half years ago, almost seven years ago now, right? And uh, I was addicted. And I, 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 I sucked at jujitsu for about, well, I, I still suck. I suck less now. Um, but, uh, you know, for the first year and a half, I had high school kids whose parents dropped them off <laughs> school literally kill me multiple times in a five minute round. Very, very humbling. And um, yeah, and that's, and that kind of goes to show you is there's, there's a lot of companies out there. And one of my things is please vet your instructors, please vet your training. Please, if you're going to invest not only your time or not only your money, but more importantly, your time, please, please vet your instructors, ask where they've been Ask, And there's, we don't hide anything. Everything is out. You can look at all our instructor bios. Um, we actually, what's actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get back to the point about the, um, uh, about, uh, the shooting and defensive tactics books is actually a really good conversation there. But if you, if, if you look at it from a whole, we post our instructor's body cam footage of real world incidents of subject control. So of course, you know how it goes. Oh, that, that won't work in the streets. Oh, that's not going to work. Oh, they can't hold me down. Those, those kind of troll comments, which I'm so used to now, it's just, just kind of funny. And now I offer, Hey, please come to a course, sign the waiver. Understand we're going to film this and put it on YouTube. Understand that. But you are more than, I will, I will comp you a spot. And I've even offered to fly people down to course. I'll fly you down to a course. You can resist hundred percent, please. You get two, two of our team members versus you. You can resist a hundred percent. May God have mercy on your soul. You know? And that's just, and that's just how it is. The proof's in the pudding. Um, and a lot of people aren't willing to do that. I mean, we, we a hundred percent are, and it's not to like shame people. It's just say, Hey, this stuff works and we're willing to back it up. Um, to go back to your point about the firearms and the DT, we often talk about firearm guys and the DT guys in law enforcement. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. There is, there is a, there's still a divide mm -hmm. and that, and that, and that divide is a problem. Right. It's not a, it, it's not a problem. You can have guys that are really good shooters, guys that are really good jujitsu practitioners, but one guy who's jujitsu, he may suck at shooting. He may, he may, he, he may get his gun out of the holster in second and a half. Right. And you're like, dude, that's not fast enough. Right. Like his bill drill might be eight seconds. <laughs> right. Not, not good. Then you have, uh, your gun guy whose bill drill is, is, you know, under two seconds. Right. It's great time. Right. And then he may have no, absolutely zero hands-on training because I'll just shoot him. If I get there, I'll, I'll just shoot him. Well, that, well, that uh, obviously can be a problem. Well, I'll just DT them. Well, what if the situation doesn't call for DT? What if the situation doesn't call for a gun? So being well-rounded, and that's where the integration of weapons comes in, right? Because every time you go to a call, and of course you've heard this, there's a gun at every call. And that is very true gear can fail. Your gun come out of the holster when you don't want it to. Maybe you draw your pistol too early in the situation and that person closes the distance and takes the gun from you. Just how it's very easy to take a gun from somebody. Uh, very easy. If you control the leverage point, you control the muzzle of the gun, you basically, you basically can control the gun. You can take it away from them. Right? So with that being said, the, the combination of the two is where it really needs to happen. And again, props to you for preaching that being a competitive shooter. I, I did a little bit of competitive shooting and I realized when I did my first competition ever, I realized that these people are, because like I would look at my time and then I would look at their time and go, how? <laughs> like, right. <laughs> how? How are they beating me by 10 seconds? Like I am, I mean, now granted, I first competition, almost no practice, duty weapon, right? They're, they're over here with shooting high speed stuff, but still 10 seconds, <laughs> that's, almost, that's an eternity, right? And I'm like, Man, and then I just started learning more and more, talking to guys like JJ, Mike Sleeklander, you know, all these, all these high level dudes that I just, I, Shane Coley, they're amazing, amazing. They're amazing instructors. And, but if you can integrate those two together, man, think about how many situations would not be on the news. Yeah, a lot. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, I think that's that's one of the, the the downfalls in law enforcement. Hopefully, it's getting better. Is that 
you know, the importance of training. If, if you don't want to pay out these, these settlements or have these high profile, you know, uh, on the news for a, you know, a two month cycle. And then you go back to it when the trial happens. Yeah. You know, if guys are better trained and, and, you know, just have that confidence with that training, I think you're going to have less incidents. Um, otherwise you're going to do like what they're doing in California. And I hear they're trying to push it nationwide is, uh, uh, no more traffic stops. They're going to have uh, civilians doing, they're going to be like traffic specialists who are going to be doing the, I, I mean, love it. Yeah. I, I can't imagine that's going to end well. I really can't. I wouldn't want to be the, the trial suspect or subject on that. You know, can you imagine? Can you imagine? <laughs> oh man, this world. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, something else about law enforcement and, and this, this could bite you know, me a little bit, but, uh, it's true. And this is something you're talking about in your effective fitness training is, uh, the overall fitness of law enforcement officers. And in some of these posts that you've put up there, you see law enforcement officers that, you know, just are just way out of shape and overweight. And listen, I, I understand 100%, you know, you know starting out, you're on night shift and you do that for a while. And, you know, you get that sleep deprivation, you get bad eating habits. And if you don't have a solid background ahead of time on, on how to defeat that, it's easy to get screwed up with, with less sleep, that cortisol buildup, stress, and then, you know, you're eating like shit. Yeah. Oh, that's one of the phrases I say the most is the biggest threat to law enforcement is law enforcement itself. It's the profession itself. 12 hours, night shift, no eating, lack of training, lack of sleep, admin hates you, admin likes you, you know, uh, the public cell phones, um, you know, there's just so much there that needs to improve. And the fitness side of things is again, another phrase we use is fitness is the foundation for survival. We talk about use of force all the time. We, you know, we got done talking about defensive tactics for, for half an hour. And the most important level of use of force is the first level, which is officer presence. What people fail to realize is that is that first level then dictates the effectiveness, the efficiency, and the ability of all the other levels. Just you think about why is JJ Rakaza? Could you imagine would JJ be where he is if he was fat? No, there's absolutely no way, right? And the way that I see it is this: is people sometimes have a hard time. To, oh, you shouldn't talk to people like that. You are a professional. You were an adult. You understand. You obviously passed a background check. You had to pass some type of test to become a police officer. So you are, are, you have the ability to understand and comprehend that being out of shape is not good for you. Being out of shape will only do one thing, but hurt you. When you say it like that, then it's like, okay, well, maybe I should do something. Well, this is where the resources come in, right? We also, yes, we have paid resource. We also give a lot of free stuff away. A lot of free stuff. Resources, workouts, meal prep, night shift tips, based off of supplements. You can, not a huge fan of supplements, but there are certain supplements that can help um, for those that those that may have trouble falling asleep and things like that. Um, or, you know, we're kind of recovering. But yes, the foundation prior to the profession is, is, is huge. Um, but also while you're in the profession, recognizing that man, I just gained 15 pounds in like two years and it's not muscle, right? So it's not, it's obviously not going to be good. Cause again, man, like you don't want to, again, with your time in law enforcement, you don't want to put in another five years or seven years that you have and then retire a broken body, right? You want to be able to enjoy your retirement. That's what I always try to tell guys. Again, I only had seven years in where I left, but we have guys on our team that had 25 plus. We have one guy who has 30 something years, right? And he's an incredible shape. He's a complete stud. But at the same time, he made it a priority. He ate well, prioritized his sleep, took care of his family, took time off, took vacations, didn't just scrounge OT every time he could. He, you know, you got to prioritize yourself because you are the foundation of your job, but more importantly, your family and your your, your life, you know. Um, there's more to job... Uh, more to life than job. That's what I always try to tell guys. You don't want to retire a broken body. Well, I was looking at uh, your other Instagram site, Effective Fitness Training, 
and you you seem to have uh, real world scenarios where you show a clip of some police incident that that occurred, you know, the body cam or whatever, and then you incorporate that into a a fitness drill. What, what how did that come about? Right. So that kind of goes back to the to the data driven approach. Um, again, it's I was want to be very clear. It's not just me out here doing doing one thing. It's it's a whole team effort. It goes back to the data driven approach. There's a whole lot of research on law enforcement, not, and it's not always stateside law enforcement. Some of it's you know foreign governments, law enforcement, and things like that. But there are a lot of studies on load carriage injuries and things like that. And so, if you get it, it shows trends. So as it pretends to the reality versus training, we look at common common responses from suspects, common responses from law enforcement. And we say, okay, is is there a is there a more optimal way to do something? Well, let's this might be okay. Let's try this. Oh, look, here's a body cam footage. Here's a couple of real world incidents of it of this being utilized and it being effective. Okay, how do we train that and how do we train that well? Right. So, the two biggest disciplines that are not trained in fitness in general are mobility and agility, the ability to create space and the ability to conform to your environment. Right. And that also plays in a role into the defensive tactics realm. So it all kind of circles back together. Hence why we started the fitness side. And then all of a sudden I was like, man, that's that's great, but you can't bench press somebody's way into handcuffs, right? Like you have to be able to like actually know how to do that. And so that's kind of where we brought in the combative side. But yeah, so the the training versus reality is is everything. It's it's the final test. It's the Super Bowl. It's it's the real world application of of what you're teaching. And again, it may not be uh, the way, but it is a way to do something that is has a higher rate of success, right? Because we we want to navigate in optimal and non optimal uh, ways and trends. We don't just want to say, "Oh, this is the way to do something," right? Like, because there are multiple ways to re- reload your weapon, right? You're not say this is how you have to do it. Well, the situation may dictate. The situation may only allow for you to have one hand, right? It may only allow for you. You know, maybe it's dark outside. Maybe your slide release is broken, right? There's there's so many different things that that you know kind of come into play. But again, if you have that foundation of fitness, of physical ability to be able to do something, and you add on top the ability to have good concepts and principles to follow in between, kind of like those guide rails, that's going to allow you to have a higher rate of success. And that's all we're trying to give is the advantage, higher rate of success, and then reduction of injury to both uh, the officer. And of course, the suspect as well. And I know people have sometimes an issue saying that, but you know, we have a responsibility to to you know to provide the correct amount of force, reasonable enough to control or stop the threat, whatever that may be. And so, the reality versus training is just a reminder of this is why we do it. And this isn't just some like, oh, this looks cool. Let's put it on Instagram because there is there is a lot of that going on. And um, you know, the way that we approach training from a combative standpoint and from a fitness standpoint is always the minimal effective dose. What's the least amount of effort that I can put in to get maximum gain? Because obviously time's of the essence and we don't want to sit here and you can't shoot USPSA five days a week, right? You can't, but you can dry fire at your house every day for five minutes and it can be very beneficial as opposed to going to the range every day for five minutes. You can't Pack your car. Well, some people can't. I know I can't just go. Oh, I'm going to go to the range right now. I had to, it's like it's like a whole like it's almost like a small vacation for me sometimes now, you know, which which is which is unfortunate. But I know some guys can go in their backyard and have a range, and I'm like, well, that's not fair. But here we are. But I have to I have to do that. I know a lot of cops don't have that ability. So, you know, again, it's it's using that minimal effective dose, training smart, also training hard, but don't forget to train smart, kind of type deal. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, in in your Instagram, we'll finish up with this. You you were recently banned from going live. What what post made you uh, cross the the, the Instagram oh, gods in no. the, the worst kind of way? Um, it's funny you say that. So, uh, I'll, I'll have to send you the video, but I it's multiple. I get I get. I mean, it, dude, I don't even know at this point. Um, there's been times where I've had nothing reported and I'll try to go live and I'll say that I'm being banned for something for community guys. Now, it could also be a comment, could have been a post got taken down. I, at this point, I just, 
I'm just kind of going along with it. And this is also why we have different means of communication. We have email and things like that as well. But, man, I don't, it's so funny because you'll see all this other crap posted on Instagram and hundreds of thousands of likes. I post a video of how to provide education to how to stay alive. And they're like, oh, it's banned. And I'm like, man, so I, I, I have a very hard time understanding that. And so I know that Mark Zuckerberg trains jujitsu. And so I was, I offered to, uh, to have a match with him. And if I, and if I beat him that he can't shadow ban me anymore, I, I would, I would, I would gladly take that, take that match with him. That's the, I don't, I don't compete in jujitsu anymore, but if I did, that's the only time I would ever do it. Um, but no, I just, I always, I always thought it was funny. Um, that this page gets shadow banned so much and I'm, I'm shadow banned right now. People can't look me up. If I think they had to follow and notify, I don't, I don't even know anymore, man. I just, I, I just lost track. Yeah. It's a, it's a fine line that you got to walk with this stuff. I know. It's, it's uh, unfortunate. Yeah. No, uh, my, my page was, I had suspended and it wasn't even my fault. Uh, there was another site. There was another, uh, Instagram page called firearms nation that was selling guns. So oh. they, so I can, now I have like no gun sale just to make sure that it's in there that listen, I am, I, I'm, you know, I don't sell guns. I, I was called firearms nation, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a tough thing. We you know the gun world, the cop world, uh, it makes them very nervous. Uh, but what I, I will do is I, <laughs> yeah, uh, I will link all your, uh, pages on, on awesome. this post. Uh, so, this blog post and then uh, up on the YouTube channel so people can go find you. Uh, but so besides the Instagram, you have a podcast, the Be Effective podcast. Uh, you talk to a lot of great people. Uh, if people want to train with you or learn more about you, where, where do they go? Sure. Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for having me. This is this is awesome. Firearms Nation. I love the name. Um, please don't ban him. And with that being said, um, you guys can always check out the efcombatives.com website. And on there, we have our in-person courses that are listed all over the country. We also have hosting information. If you guys are interested in hosting a course, we do not, most of the courses are law enforcement driven courses. However, they are open enrollment. So if you just want to understand more about training and weapons to be more proficient, um, obviously you have to pass some type of background check and we just don't allow anybody to come train with us, uh, but uh, private security for military corrections, so on and so forth are always allowed. Um, check it out. We also have the online training as well. You can, we have a app you download on your phone and you get basically a course curriculum there. Effective fitness is effective.fitness, no.com. And you can go on there, check out everything we have to offer online program. We do have some agency programs as well, some health and wellness programs that we can integrate within your law enforcement agency as well. So that's really it. And as, as it pertains to the podcast, I'm actually, um, I have five more episodes to record and then I'm actually going on a little hiatus. So just cause these two companies require more attention. So yes, I have some very good guests on there and you know, amazing, amazing guests. So very grateful for all of that. And of course, grateful for your time and what you've done and what you're currently doing in law enforcement. Thank you for that. Thank you and uh, have a, a great holiday weekend and everyone out there be safe and thank you, Adam, for coming on the show. Of course.